What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Good morning, happy Friday. Welcome to Whispering Hope. And this morning, we have in the house, Dr. Wayne and Dr. K. White. And our brand new quarter has begun, the great controversy. And all week, we have been looking at the topic, the war behind all wars. And so I'm going to invite both of them to greet us. And then we're going to ask Pastor K. White to pray for us to jump into our study for today, this brand new quarter, this brand new study. Well, it's going to be an interesting study. Let me say good morning to everyone. And I hope and trust that this Friday will bring you great blessing and a good spiritual journey as you take it one moment at a time. Right, good morning to everyone. It's always a pleasure to be on Whispering Hope Sabbath School. And it's also exciting to be back for this new quarter. Uh, we know God has so much to say to us and we anticipate opening up the Holy Spirit even today in this study. That's why as we pray. Uh, Father, today we thank you for this new day. We thank you for your mercies, new every morning. We thank you for your word, which is able to bring about revival, reformation, transformation in our lives. We thank you for this important topic, even throughout this quarter, even the lesson today, leading and directing our study. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we begin with our topic, the war behind all wars. What does this topic mean to either of you or to both of you? Well, it's suggesting, just as it says, there's a war behind all wars i i want to think that all wars refer to the wars we are visibly audibly able to observe or hear about because earthly wars are those that we can relate to but it's suggesting that there's a another war and that war is the one that is responsible for all these wars between us and i think the lesson we're going to get into detail as to who are the factors the main players in that war behind all these earthly wars that we do hear about and be a part of today. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Dr. Knowles. Hey, as we consider the world around us, we see wars. Presently in our world, there are a number of wars that we are reading about and we're hearing about on the news. And we see the impact of the wars in, in, on the political world, on the economies of the world. We see displaced families, we see children, who are crying, families going through difficulties as a result of the wars. And we see even in our little island, you know, the rise in food prices, sometimes gas prices because of wars in other parts of the world. And I believe the title is appropriate because as we consider implications and the impact of the, the wars, you know, we're able now this week to discuss the reason behind the wars. And I think today this is a very appropriate title. As we consider, as Dr. Knowles mentioned, there, there's a bigger war, there's a bigger story, and we only see the impact of this great controversy which has impacted our, our world. Amen. So it's time for us to look at Revelation 12, 7 and 8, our memory text for today. And it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so pastors, doctors, we're going to ask you all to unpack Revelation 12, 7 and 8 for us. Yeah, this is a very significant passage as we consider the war that we're talking about, the great controversy and the war behind all wars, as the title mentioned. And so this, we can say, was the first war, uh, the first major tension that we know of based on biblical records in the universe the first major disagreement in the universe. And clearly there are two players mentioned here. We see Michael, uh, who is Christ. We see Satan, uh, who is Lucifer, in the tension. We also see a few things. The Bible says that Satan or Lucifer was um, thrown out of heaven. And it clearly shows a number of things. One, that Michael you know, has greater strength 
than, than Lucifer. And I think that's good news because that also shows that good has greater impact and strength than, than evil. So I would leave it there. All right, just to add a few things, it really speaks to who the players in the war are, and it also speaks to where this war is being fought. This is not an earthly war, and it's not a war between man and man, or woman and woman, or people. Neither is it a war between human beings and God, or spirits. It is really fought at another location, and it's really fought against spirit beings. And so this particular war may have been one of the, the critical um, encounters that resulted in Satan being cast out. We know that there will be the great battle of Armageddon towards the end, and that will be war again. We do not have any description of a previous war, but we have description of conflict when we look at Isaiah 14 and so on, between when he wanted the throne of God. But now we see that, you know, is either the war has heated up, but this time it says that the dragon and Michael, who we understand to be Christ, and uh, from a seven Adventist perspective, we understand Michael, the archangel representing Christ, who fights on God's behalf against Satan. And uh, what I like in, the, in this conflict is that it says that the dragon and his angels fought and they did not prevail. And that to me is good news in spite of the wars and the conflicts that we go on. But the second part of the good news is that there was no place found for them in heaven any longer. This is good news. But when we get to the next verse, we're talking about the context now. It really tells us that it wasn't good news for us in terms of the experience, but the outcome is going to be great for us because it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the dragon, the devil has come down with great fury, right? Because he knows that he has a short time. So the inhabitants of the earth will go through a rough time because Satan is cast out and he's angry that he has lost this part of the war. But I like also the first part where he says Michael and his angels fought. It seems as though Michael was tired of Satan's challenges and says it's time to get out. And Satan fought back because notice the, the fight seems to start with Michael saying, listen, this is this is enough. Enough is enough. Satan the dragon and his angels fought. That's his, that's the, it's, it's as though they are fighting back, but they could not prevail, so they couldn't stay. And so there came a point when enough was enough, and uh, he was cast out. But we know the end of the story, and the end of the story says that one day, not only will they be cast out to the earth, but the earth, the hell fire, the lake of fire, will destroy Satan and his angels forever. So that's the final outcome. And so... I, I give God thanks for the opportunity to know that I can keep on fighting in this, this battle because victory is assured in the long run. Amen. You know, this question I'm about to ask, I have asked it several times. So I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. If God knew that Lucifer was going to rebel, why did he give him the power of choice in the first place? Or when Lucifer rebelled, why didn't God just annihilate him immediately? Yeah, this is a very significant question. Even as a young person growing up in the Adventist church, it's a, it's a question I always ask myself, you know, if God knew this would, because we know he has the, the knowledge, the foreknowledge, why would he still allow? Uh, but I believe Mark Finley did an exceptional um, job this week in, in explaining. I suspect so the quarter will continue to see it unfold. But definitely... We see freedom of choice is a result of God's loving character. Who he is as an individual, uh, the writer this week quoting from Ellen White, and I think it's such a beautiful quotation, that love awakens love. I think this is so heavy. In other words, love cannot be fought. A loving relationship is a relationship where both individuals are loving each other. Anytime one person is being forced to love, then that individual will not be happy. Uh, that individual will not be comfortable in, in the relationship. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And it goes back to the same quotation from Ellen White, that his love for us awakens our love for him. 
and we respond to his love because of all what he has done for us. Now, as we consider uh, that, you know, Satan's rebellion and the way God operated, and uh, not destroying him right away, but allowing him to even have enough time to speak to the angels and to mobilize them and to create a rebellion, it speaks also to his character, which is a loving character. The Bible says love suffereth long and is kind. So we see the kindness of God. We see the long-suffering character or nature of God come just all being realized in the way he operated when Satan clearly, Lucifer clearly was creating this tension and organizing this rebellion in his presence. So I believe everything centers or everything goes back to God's love. His character, who he is, he's patient. And I love the fact that love gives freedom of choice. Yeah, just to add to what Dr. White shared, I think that the question presupposes that there are tensions between God's knowledge and his ability to give freedom of choice because of what he knows. Many of us in our world, which is sinful, we tend to struggle with that because I know who you are. I'm going to limit you. I'm going to put you in prison. I'm going to lock you here because of what I know. So it, it presupposes that there could be a tension between both in our environment yes there are tensions and so we ask these questions but when we the little we know about god there's no tension between god doing that he can know and still give you the choice and that's what he does for us all the time he, he there's no tension for god to do that and that's why many of us struggle with questions because our knowledge oftentimes determine how we relate to people but God can know you, <laughs> you are the worst person and still love you anyhow. And you have no shadow of doubt and he wouldn't really fake it. He will love you genuinely, even though you are the worst person. So for I think it's important to note that a perfect God doesn't have a tension between his foreknowledge and uh, his ability to give us everything that he promised us. So choice, the, giving us choice, therefore, was not a tension point for him because he loves us, as Pastor White just shared, and he's going to give us all that we deserve despite what he knows we're going to do with it. And sometimes when we look at the story of the prodigal son, right, the attitude of the, of the, the, the second son was already known. I don't believe it's just one day he got up. It seems to have been an attitude, a pattern, a habit, and yet still the father didn't challenge. The father knew he would mess up and the father looked for him to come back because the father knew the nature of his son and he was willing to give him freedom to, to make the choice that he wanted. So I think it's consistent with God. It may not be consistent with many of us. It may be a struggle for us, but it's not a struggle for God. And so I can see reasons why we ask these questions, but God is bigger than that. And so he would always be fair to us and he always give us more than we deserve. Amen. What kind of reaction might the unfallen universe have if God had immediately wiped Lucifer out? Yeah, the unfallen universe is a very interesting aspect of the great controversy and a very significant part of the controversy. When, when, when I uh, thought of that question, a scenario came to my mind as it relates to leadership. I mean, all in leadership, Dr. Knowles, um, Sister Challenger, you're a leader in the church. And what came to my mind is an illustration of someone um, confronting you as a leader. Maybe they're indifferent and they're rude and they embarrass you as a leader. And you have the opportunity to respond to that person on an individual basis. But at the same time, the entire congregation is watching you. Two reasons why you would respond a certain way. One, as a leader, you're a spiritual leader and you love the individual. And God loved everyone he created, even though he knew that they would rebel. I think Dr. Nose beautifully um, shared that. And two, as a leader, not only, going back to the human element now, not, not only do you love as a leader that individual who may be outright rebellious and, and indifferent to you in the presence of everyone, you consider the others who now have to understand that you're a spiritual leader and they're looking on. It's in a similar way as it relates to the entire universe. God is a loving God. He loves Lucifer and all the fallen angels. And so his response definitely would be out of love. But number two, his response is taking into consideration the others who are also looking at him as their God 
and his own character. Not that God has to try to prove anything to anyone, but his character has to be realized in everything that he does. Thus, I would answer that uh, that question, just using that analogy, and let Dr. Lewis continue to give his answer. Okay, it's a very good analogy. One who I would have chosen myself, Dr. White. What I would say is that God is the only one with all knowledge. The universe, the unfallen worlds, the angels, the human beings that he created do not have unlimited knowledge. And I think it's a teachable moment for the entire universe. God knows how he made them. If you make a car, you know how you make it to function. You know how many miles, you know what it can take, you know how fast you can drive it. And so he knows the limitation of the entire universe and, and he understands what would be the best approach to ensure that they they understand the, the, the benefits or the demerits of a particular choice. So I believe that God in his wisdom realized that it's best to allow it to play out, right? It's best to allow it to play out because it's going, the universe is going to learn so much. Because only God has foreknowledge. They would have known only good. But remember, good by itself always creates the curiosity for wanting to know the other option. We see that in the Garden of Eden. And so I think this was just a, a wonderful school to demonstrate who God is, to demonstrate his love, to demonstrate the dangers of going outside of God. And so if God would have taken out Lucifer and the other angels at that point, he would have missed a grand opportunity to teach about himself and also the nature of sin. And I think that they could have reacted that, listen, we just disappear, right? The suffering of being separated from God would have been terrible for Satan, right? Anyone separated from God cannot have a great experience. The universe would see that. Just as they saw, they would see what happens to mankind as we separate. They would have seen that. Not being able to see that means that they would not have seen what sin looks like. They would have seen that disobedience brings annihilation, but they would not have seen how it plays out in the life of the one who has disobeyed. So I think it's a learning school. It's God's university. I think that God knows best in this context to teach about himself, his character, and also the nature of sin as well. Amen. What is the concept of the universe's interest in the plan of salvation as found in 1 Peter 1, 12, Revelation 5, 13, Revelation 16, 7? So important to understanding this great controversy. Let me jump in. I think that it's important for us to recognize the context of the universe because sometimes we only see as far as our eyes can see and hear as far as our ears can hear and that's our world the internet era has exposed us to many cultures many belief systems and a lot of people can't handle it right you see how churches you know people used to wait on leadership for information that's not the issue anymore and you see how people are unable to handle different information so jesus prayed for unity in the church i think for reasons like this but the universe having been able to be exposed to the whole idea of what sin looks like would be able to see how god responds to the sinner and to see that god has a that amount of love that even when we make the bad choice he doesn't love us less he has a plan to save us and so the whole universe will learn so much out of this terrible experience that we, the sinful world, are going through. It's a terrible experience. It's the worst we could ever think of. But it's a wonderful learning school for the universe to know that this is what sin is going to lead to. And this is what this God is going to, you know, loves us so much that he is still willing to save us even when we're at the worst. So he loves the good, the bad, and the indifferent people, but he doesn't love the good, the, the bad and the indifferent sin that is in us, but he loved the sinners. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Knowles, for that. And as we consider the universe in our little own space, we are on planet Earth, and so that is our our universe. But we recognize that God has to consider not only planet Earth, but even the unfallen universe that's been mentioned a lot in the lesson study this week. And so God has to rescue a lost planet, 
Uh, he has to put everything in place to save this lost planet uh, because the controversy has expanded on the on the lost planet with Satan now being in the garden and Eve um, being tempted and Adam and they yielding to the temptation. And so God has to be with this fallen planet. He also has to now consider the other unfallen universe Universal beings who have not yet, who have not been impacted by sin, and how he's going to allow all this to play out. And Dr. Knowles beautifully answered it earlier that God is going to allow it to just play out, let the consequences and implications of sin be realized, that it get ripe to the extent that the unfallen world can see what is happening, and even those of us on this planet in peril can also understand the implications of sin. And so definitely God's interest in the entire universe um, somehow is captured in the great controversy where he has to balance the fallen and the unfallen and still vindicate his own character and allow everything to fall in place. So God has a heavy task, but he is God. And as Dr. Luz Pidipidi said, it's his school, his university, and he has everything under control. He's not baffled, he's not shaken. He knows what he's doing, and we trust in the end that evil will not rise second time. Amen. Very, very powerful statement coming from both of you, Dallas. What reason or reasons can you think of for Christ's death on the cross? Was it only to reveal the character of God, or was it to pay the ransom for sin? If so, to whom was the ransom paid? <laughs> Tell us. What's your thoughts on all of these questions? Well, based on the Bible, we see God, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, first of all, uh, to reconcile man back to God. We know that in the, in the Garden of Eden, there was a separation. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says that your sin has created a separation. And the Apostle Paul says that God is being reconciled back to, or we've been reconciled back to God, to Christ. So Christ is the one who is facilitating the reconciliation process. So reconciliation is definitely one of the major reasons why Jesus had to die. We spoke about earlier the unfallen universe, uh, 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 a world uh, who are looking on. And so God then has to expose his character and allowing his son to come, his only son to die on the cross. And he goes back to the same point that Dr. Noah made about in relation to the consequences of sin, allowing it to play out. Because the fact that the son of God, who is God himself, had to die, clearly shows that the consequences of sin, you know, it, 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 it's intense, it's grave, it is, it is a lot. And so even the son of God had to die. So Jesus came to die. He, come, he came to pay for our sin, the penalty. He came to pay the penalty. For us, uh, it's, it's amazing, or the ransom, ransom, penalty ransom, in the case of someone being kidnapped and someone has to come and pay the ransom, I think that's a very um, human analogy. So yes, Jesus came to do that. But when I read the second question, to who, it, it kind of baffled me. And I did some reading, and I want to read a quotation from Ellen White, because I think there's something here that's interesting. Ellen White says, Satan refused to let his captives go. That's the universe. He held them as his subject because of their belief in his line. That would be from Adam and Eve to our generation. He had thus become their jailer. So we are like in prison. But he had no right to demand that a price be paid for them because he had not obtained possession of them by lawful conquest, but under false pretense. So when I thought about who should the ransom be paid to, Initially, I said maybe to Satan, but Ellen White says, no, Satan took the universe in pretense. So God really didn't have to pay ransom to anyone. He is God. He made a choice to pay a ransom, but he is God, and he is not obligated to do anything to Satan because what Satan held onto it and said, this is mine, is all in pretense because he has never owned the universe. And he has never owned us. So I thought that was very instructive. All right. I will just add a few points. Thank you, uh, Pastor White. The it, It's a loaded question. It has multiple parts. So I'll answer in two parts. It speaks to, first of all, the whole aspect of Christ's death on the cross. 
Was it only to reveal the character of God? Was it to pay the ransom price for sin? Well, I think we can't separate the character of God and the ransom price because one speaks of the other based on God's goodness. He will pay the price because he loves us. And uh, if he pays the price, he says it really goes back to the fact that he's a good God. So I don't think it's one or the other. It's both. I don't think we can separate both because only a person of good character will pay the price. And only if you pay the price, it shows you have good character. So sometimes there's debate between these, but I don't think that you can have one without the other. So it's it's really a demonstration of God's love and the goodness of God, why he would have paid the price. And, and so it, it plays out there. But the second part of the question is one that many theologians debated because the, the term ransom is used which is not the most common expression used. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he sent his Son, that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible also says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So most of the passages do not use the term ransom. And even when it speaks of ransom, it doesn't say ransom to anyone. But I, I did check the word ransom and realize it's a price paid to somebody. And it's it's generally about money. No money was passed. And so it's really speaking to the fact that no matter how costly sin was, God was able to rescue us by giving his life. You cannot go better than someone giving his life. So it's not a chance action that someone will say on the other end, thank you for paying me this. There's no money involved. It's just the fact that sin is costly, cost us everything. And it cost God his son. That's that's basically what it is. One, our life cost God the life of his son. And so the price is paid. Your sins are covered. And so that's the ransom. That That's the context for it. And so it's important for us to realize he didn't have to pay Satan anything. And God didn't have to pay himself anything. Because if you're paying yourself something, then the money is coming from you and it's going back to you. So you really haven't added anything. So those theological debates really are taking the argument too far because the emphasis of scripture is that God loves us enough that Jesus Christ came, the word became flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And all is saying that the cost of sin, you know, was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, great contribution, Docs. You know, when we use the term, the great controversy, what do we really mean? And how can we apply this to our own life? Have you seen it being played out in your life? Talk to us, Docs. But yeah. for Seven Adventists, really, it speaks to the great cosmic conflict, the conflict behind the scenes between good and evil, God and Satan, and the Seven Adventist websites are under the doctrine of great controversy speaks to the fact that God's character is on the line. And so it's about good and evil. God for us, the devil against us. And definitely, yes, it's a daily battle that we all have to go through where the enemy tempts us. We live in a sinful world caused because of sin. And we are born in sin and, sin and shaped in iniquity. So the whole aspect of sin from a universal perspective it has affected us. We're born into it and it continues to play out in our lives. So it is a daily, not necessarily a struggle, but a daily um, interaction that we have with it. Because if, if we are trusting in God, struggles will come, but they're also days of victory and celebration and joy and happiness. We don't go around every day with a sad face, you know, that we are in war. You know, God does give us victory and we do have time for rejoice. In in, in um in Psalm 23, it says that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. There's time for rejoicing. There's time to know that he who is with us is greater than they that are against us. So there, there will be battle times, but there will also be rejoicing times as we win the battles as well. Amen, amen. And a great controversy also, you know, presents that, that level of hope. Um, as Dr. Nose is sharing, that yes, there is a tension every day, and I'm going to speak more to our lives. Second half, I think Dr. Nose answered first half beautifully, that every day there, there is a tension. And we see the Apostle Paul, he is crying out uh, in his own experience, the spiritual leader, the things I want to do, I'm not doing those things, and the things I really don't want to do, I'm battling. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? So every day, uh, the great controversy is realized the struggle is real. The struggle is real. None of us is perfect. We struggle every day. 
and the controversy, good and evil, and good doing what is right, evil, of course, doing what is inappropriate and rebellious. Every day we have to make that decision. But today there is hope that in the great controversy, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless I live, but yet not I. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So yes, great controversy is good and evil. But there is hope in my life and in your life every day that the Holy Spirit is able to sanctify us, revive us, and allow the flesh to be killed and the new man to be resurrected every single day. So there is still hope in the controversy for the Christian. Amen. You know what Bible text can we use that talks about the reality of the great controversy? Yeah, the text I would embrace, uh, it was shared this week by the, by the author, uh, uh, Genesis 3.15, I think this is a major passage as we consider the great controversy. And uh, clearly, Adam and Eve, they sinned, they were disobedient, and God had a plan to save them. And the text indicating, uh, I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15, we see it playing out here. That if it's tension, that there is war between the woman and the serpent, the woman being the church, the woman serpent of, of being Christ, of being Satan. Let me go back. Let me say that first. The woman being the church and the serpent being Satan. But even bigger than that, the, the woman is not just the church and the context of Seventh day Adventist church or such to be denomination. The woman also humanity, that everyone who's played by sin, there is continue, there's a continuous tension between the two. But then we also see victory there where Christ himself will be will suffer some, some bruising at his heel, but Christ will also give Satan a fatal blow to the head, to Calvary. And so we see the great controversy playing out in this passage, but the passage is one of hope. The same hope we're talking about, that in the end, uh, Jesus Christ will be victorious, that his death on Calvary's cross, reconcile man back to God that ultimately good will triumph over evil. And so this is one of the major passages in scripture which brings out, which exposes the controversy theme, but also explains the hope that will come in the end and the victory in Jesus Christ. I want to add a few more passages to what Dr. White just shared. Our lesson brought out a few. Job 1 with the universal conflict when Satan went to meet with the other sons of God in the book of Job and how he asks God to really test Job by, you know, creating hurt and harm and injury to him. That's a great controversy is the back of the scene. You know, Job would know what's happened to him there, but it's Satan who or orchestrated it. Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us a, a similar thing that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So we see behind the scene, there is that great conflict taking place. Other passages, in addition to what Dr. White shared, the great controversy scene for me that stands out is when heaven and earth battle on earth as well. Because when Christ came to earth, John's gospel said, is a man sent from God, not, not John the, the Baptist, but one who was from the bosom of God. And he came to be among us. And we see what happened in the wilderness. It's like the forces of, uh, of good and evil has come to earth to battle it out. That's what the cross represents, the, the great controversy being fought here. That's what Jesus preached when he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is here. And the kingdom of God brings destruction against the kingdom and forces of darkness. And so we see it's like he said that a strong man entering into another man's territory. So we see God coming in to invade what the enemy thought was his. And so we see the, the, the great controversy being played out right on earth. Every step, every move, every healing, every sermon that Jesus had done was really the great controversy playing out here on earth. And so when Christ went back up to heaven, he says, listen, just before he went back up, he says, all authority is mine now in heaven and earth. I've come down and I've conquered. I've gone back up. You don't have any more access, you know, and he kicked him out. And so we see how it plays out. So all these passages and the whole book of Revelation really points to the fact that 
the great controversy between Christ and Satan continues. Satan has come down to make war with us. Very angry. So the great controversy is coming down here to create havoc. But Christ, when he walked among the candlesticks, said, I, I haven't abandoned you. Problem in the church, I'm here with you. Problems in the church against church members fighting, I'm here with you. Problems the world against you, I'm here with you. Satan against you, I'm here with you. All the governments and leaders come together, I am here with you. And in the end, we're going to have the victory. So the great controversy demonstrates that God will win. And if we are on his side, we too will win as well. Amen. You know, there's so many gems that we can pull from what both of you have said this morning. But I'm going to merge the two questions in the interest of time. It says, how is the Seventh Adventist understanding unique among other Christian denominations? And what is this great controversy team that sets us apart? I think there are some major areas which allow us to be different as some of the Adventists as we consider the great controversy. But most of them highlighted in this first lesson, we see the concept of the unfallen universe or the unfallen world. This is a unique um, concept as it relates to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, my understanding. Our spirit of prophecy speaks highly about the unfallen universe and the way God has to respond to them as opposed to planet Earth that we live on. But also as Michael, uh, we spoke about Michael earlier, Dr. Nov gave a very exciting an informative concept of our understanding of who Michael is being Christ. We see it in the book of we see him in the book of Revelation. We also see him in Daniel twelve one, where the Bible says that, uh, Michael will stand the great prince, and and that's a definitely a unique doctrine to the Adventist Church. The concept of freedom of choice, I think, is also an amazingly well, a beautifully coined concept from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I won't say other churches don't emphasize it, but I love, in fact, the writer says that it is, in, in, it is in our best interest for God to give us freedom of choice. And the way we are able to really connect it with all the evil in the world, and people say, why is, if God is so good, why so much evil? The way we're able to link that to freedom of choice and God's character, I think definitely the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have been able to really capture this through the power of the Spirit and to the understanding of the Scriptures. Yeah, it's an interesting twofold question because it is projecting a thought that we should accept. And number one is that the on Seven Adventist understanding is unique among the denominations. It's, it presupposes that you know that. The question is, is it that unique? And I think there are some unique areas, but I think all Christians do consider a great controversy. What I think is unique about the seven event is, is our is our emphasis. Having come out of the great disappointment, having come out of the whole prophetic movement, I think it does give us a, a, a unique emphasis. But I don't think that the teaching itself is unique. There are some aspects of it in many other doctrines that we hold that we hold unique to others. But I think the whole aspect of great controversy is around, you know, most people know that there's war between good and evil. You know, God is, is there. I will add one more to one of the unique areas. I think we have unique areas, but not that the doctrine is unique to us. One of the areas I will add to what Pastor White shared, because our understanding of Michael the Archangel, few denominations look at, at Michael as Jesus, and also few also see the the universe with the in job chapter one as unfallen worlds the sons of god when they met as unfallen worlds this gives us a kind of universal picture to see how satan seeks to interface so there are some unique aspects that we hold and i think that's what stands out but the second question also presupposes something it says what is it in this great controversy theme that sets, sets us apart as seven adventists i think that what sets us apart are the unique areas that we focus on and the fact that we have a very, very strong emphasis on the, the great controversy itself. It is one of our defining elements. It is one that we, we think would play out at the end. When we teach on the three angels' messages, it really speaks to that great controversy theme 
And the three angels' messages are central to our identity as Seventh-day Adventists. But for us, I think it's the emphasis that sets us apart and not necessarily that others don't believe that there will be, you know, that there is that conflict. But we do have a very strong emphasis. And from a Seventh-day Adventist perspective, we believe that that emphasis is important as we near the end of time to let people know that there is that great conflict that there is that great battle for your soul, for your mind, for your heart, and that we need to be vigilant as Christians to keep trusting in God so that we can stand the test of time. Amen. And then we come for our takeaway of the week. But my takeaway, let me jump in. My takeaway for this week goes back to our topic, and it's speaking about the war behind all wars. It's just a reminder to us that we are part of a great cosmic conflict that and secondly that we are on the winning side that no matter how difficult it gets down here the bible creates that storyline for us that understanding that in spite of the fact that you may lose loved ones you may lose jobs for christ's sake you may lose anything in this life that christ himself has won the victory and even if you don't get everything on this side the battle will be won or has already been won by Christ and we will have our more than due reward in the long run. So keep fighting, keep faithful and keep holding on to Christ. Amen, amen. Powerful. Mine would be taken straight from the lesson. Freedom of choice is God acting in our best interest. And I think this is amazing as I consider the God who loves me, that he has given me the choice to love him. And he's done enough to open the door so that I can reach out to him. He says, come now, let us reason together. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. So there's an invitation, a loving invitation. And today I'm very excited. And I know we're all excited on this platform today to reach out to that, that God. We're not being forced. We love him because he first loved us. That would be my Amen. This morning, I just want to thank both of you for this powerful sharing of this lesson. You know, there are so many thoughts that need further development, but in the interest of time, I ask that we look at this lesson again. It's very powerful. And as we consider the war behind all wars, consider, as Dr. Knowles rightly said, we're on the winning side. We may be battered and bruised, but in the end, we are on the winning side. And so I want to thank both pastors, both doctors for being on with us this morning and tomorrow morning we continue to look at the great controversy but the afternoon is the grand finale and we invite everybody in antigua the Jennings seventh -day adventist church for worthy is the lamb worship experience and we want to thank all of our viewers on whispering hope on signs of the time ministry and second advent for being a part of our discussion so until i see you again god bless